Father, we thank you that we do not have to stand in your presence based on our own strength, based on our own power, based on our own righteousness. But we stand before you cleansed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his death, by his burial, by his resurrection, by our faith in his sacrifice as the full and complete payment for our sins, by grace through faith we have righteousness in Christ. Therefore, we have no fear. We stand in Christ alone. Father, I pray that as we look at Romans chapter 7 this morning, that uh, its truths would strike deep into our hearts. I pray, Father, that your truth would be clear, that um, any thoughts that are our mind that are not totally consistent with your word, that you would suppress those. I pray, Lord, that my words would be completely in harmony, in line with your words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans 7. As you're turning to Romans 7, I'm just going to skip ahead because uh, this actually starts, the song actually starts in chapter 6 because in chapter 6 um, we have forgiveness in Christ and we are dead to sin. Romans 6, 2 says we are buried with Christ, baptized into him, baptized into his death. And then over in chapter 8, which will be a few weeks away yet, um, Paul asks, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Then he goes on to verse 38, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So some of the phrases and the truths that were in the song come straight out of this section right here. No power in death, no power of hell, no scheme of man, nothing can ever pluck us from his hand because of his power, his grace and his love, we are secure in him. Not because of our own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the price that was paid for our salvation. Well, we uh, covered almost four verses last Sunday. Uh, I was probably a little bit ambitious in hoping that I would get through chapter 13, and that didn't exactly happen. So we're going to kind of pick back up here in this section, here in Romans 7 and 8, there are some kind of difficulties. There are some serious interpretive challenges here. Uh, there's the question of whether or not Paul is speaking about himself. Or is he speaking of someone else? Some say uh, that he's speaking of Israel. Some say that he's speaking even of Adam. I think it's best that Paul is speaking of himself. I think that's the best way to understand it. Some focus on verses 2 and 3, which we'll touch briefly on again. And they say that that means that there's no such thing as divorce and remarriage. And if you get divorced and remarried, then you're living in sin. Well, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, in fact, the reality of it is that Jesus addressed that. And he clearly gave the exception in Matthew 19, 6 for immorality, except for fornication, uh, and that was uh, an exception, Matthew 19, 6, 7, 8, 9, right around through there. Paul gave the exception for desertion. He seemed to have also left the door open for some past mistakes in their, in their, in their lives before Christ uh, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But that's not what Paul is addressing. Paul is, is speaking to the law and how we are dead to the law. In fact, Paul does not even bring the subject of divorce up uh, in the book of Romans at all. It's not mentioned. Jesus mentions it. Uh, Paul mentions it in 1 Corinthians, but not here. So uh, further, some have used uh, these two chapters to argue and say that this proves that we are sanctified and we no longer sin. We can reach a point where that sin is no longer an issue. Uh, they say we can have total sanctification. Um, I don't think that's what Scripture is teaching either. Uh, one of the things that we do need to keep in mind whenever we study Scripture 
<clears throat> is if Scripture is faithfully and accurately presented, it will be true to life. We don't judge Scripture based on our experience, but there is nothing more true to life than the Word of God. And so if we rightly understand the Word of God, rightly interpret and apply the Word of God, it will prove to be true to life. Just for instance, there are some who say that uh, if you just have faith and if you just pray and two or three of you pray, then God will give you anything. Well, if you happen to look out uh, in the front as you go by, you'll see my 2001 F-150. It's got uh, 293,000 miles on it. Uh, I have never felt compelled, at least not for a number of years, for three of us to get together and pray for a new Mercedes. Uh, but the reality is, if, if we could do that, I would just go all the way and get a Lamborghini or a Maserati. Uh, but the reality is, uh, that's not how life works. Uh, the reality is that some teach that, well, you, if you pray, you can be healed of whatever you have. And yet, some of the famous faith healers of the past have died with cancer. The reality is that we live in a sin-cursed world. And whenever someone tries to sell you something that sounds too good to be true in life and in theology, there's a pretty good chance that it probably is too good to be true. So we balance out Scripture and we evaluate it from the Word of God. Uh, now, not everything in Scripture can be tested that way, but the realities of life many times... Uh, can be balanced out against what Scripture says. Um, some key terms that Paul uses that we need to keep in mind, uh, and that is that, first of all, he speaks of, and this is a little bit of review, uh, this is the first part of your notes, and that is that there are those who are in the flesh. In verse 5, and we'll get to that in a minute, Paul speaks of being in the flesh. In the flesh is an unbeliever. Over in chapter 8, he will speak to those who are in the Spirit. Those who are not in the flesh but are in the Spirit, those are believers. Those who by grace have received the gift of salvation, have been cleansed, made righteous, not on the basis of their own righteousness, but on the basis of the righteousness that only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. They are in Christ. They are in the Spirit. Now, of the ones in that group who are believers, there are two possibilities for them. They can either be living after the flesh, that is, they're believers, but they're living for themselves, they're living for the things of this world, or they can be after pursuing, concerned with the things of the Spirit. And those are believers who are committed to the Lord, committed to, to living for Him. So those are some important distinctions to keep in mind. Now, we will never be sin less in this world. As long as we're in this body of flesh, we will struggle with the sin nature. If someone ever tells you that now that I've come to Christ, I don't sin anymore, that was one right there. They just lied. See, there's three kinds of sin. There are sins of commission, the things that we commit. There's sins of omission, the things that we omit. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. You know, we might can do okay on sins of commission for a time. You know, we don't do it. But the reality is there's also the things that we're supposed to do. And the third one's going to get us all, and those are sins of disposition. When we do the right thing for the wrong reason. When our heart is not pure before the Lord, and we do things selfishly or out of pride or for whatever reason. So you, you want, if we understand sin, that's going to kind of catch all of us. So as long as we are... Growing in the Lord, we should sin less, but we will never reach the point where we are sinless. And that's an important distinction to understand biblically. And Paul is talking about that struggle here in Romans chapter 7 and in Romans chapter 8. We noted last week that in chapter 6, Paul has just stated and taught that the believer, once we are in Christ, we are dead to sin. We are buried with Christ. And what that means is that sin does not have to have the victory over us. We can yield ourselves to the Lord. We can reckon ourselves dead to sin. Uh, back there in uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 11, 12, and 13, 
We can resist yielding ourselves to the flesh and we can yield ourselves to God. And as we yield ourselves to Him, the power of Christ through us will give us victory over sin. But as long as we are in this body of flesh, we will never do that perfectly. We will only be sinless. We will only be freed from that struggle when we are in the Lord's presence, whether by death or whether by His return. But only when we are in His presence will we have complete victory over that. Now, Paul, having just completed the analogy of being dead to sin, being no longer a slave to sin, now talks about being dead to the law. In chapter 7, verse 1, the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And then he gives the illustration of being married. Married. You are only married to someone as long as you both live. I know this is not a real popular idea in our culture today, uh, but there's something in the wedding ceremony, there's something in the words of the Lord Jesus where he says, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And in all weddings I've ever done, I give in the vows the phrase, till death do us part. Now let me just say, that that's the original design, that's the original plan. But one man, one woman, one lifetime in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 was kind of messed up when sin came on the scene. And when Adam and Eve sinned, that kind of messed up where we are. Jesus in Matthew 19, as he discusses this, he says, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, because of your sin, Moses made concessions. And that's in Deuteronomy 24. You can look at that later, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. The references are in your notes. But the reality is the plan was one man, one woman, one lifetime. But the reality is because of sin, sometimes we mess up. And I want to be very, very clear here. I want you to stay with me on this, okay? There is such a thing as the unpardonable sin. Jesus spoke to that sin. In Jesus' day, the sin that had no forgiveness is to see the miracles of Jesus and then to reject the Holy Spirit's testimony as to who Jesus was based on those miracles which demonstrated that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. In our day, the unpardonable sin is when we hear the Word of God and the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts convincing us that we are sinners, that Jesus is Savior, and we reject that salvation. The writer of Hebrews asks, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And the answer is, if we refuse the salvation in Christ, there is no escape. There is nothing but judgment that awaits. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh to the Father but by me. In our culture today, we want to just kind of have this idea that well, all roads lead to Rome. We all worship the same God. We're all going to make it to heaven one day. Jesus himself said, I am the way. That's pretty exclusive, isn't it? He didn't say I'm one of the ways. He didn't say I am a way. I am the way, the truth, the life. And in case that's not clear enough, he adds, no man comes to the Father except by me, through me. That's the only way, Jesus Christ. So as we, as we understand that salvation is only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that's a key thing that we need to grab a hold of. It's not by what we do. It's not by any other way. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. So that is the unpardonable sin. And I know some of you may have been in churches. And I'm aware of churches. I've heard of churches where right up there beside the unpardonable sin of rejecting Jesus, just maybe one level down is the sin of divorce. And I want to tell you that is not a distinction that you will find in the Word of God. You may have been the one who was guilty of immorality, of adultery, of unfaithfulness or whatever, maybe repeatedly, but I want to tell you this, the grace of of God is sufficient to provide forgiveness. And anyone who tells you that the grace of God can't cover that is a liar. God's grace is sufficient, no matter how bad we've messed up. Aren't you glad of that? 
In any case, verse 4, Paul continues, Wherefore, brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That's the picture of the marriage. You're dead. If, if, if someone dies, you're free from that bond. If we are in Christ, we are free from the law. It's the Mosaic law. The references there contextually go back. We won't dig into that now. But you're free, and that's the point. We are not bound to the law. Whether we're, whether we're Jews or whether we have been taught that, whether it's the law in our hearts, we are free from the law. We are not bound by the law. The law was never given to bring salvation. Romans 3, 19, and we've looked at this and we've repeated it a number of times. Now we know that what things, soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Verse 20 goes on, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified, declared righteous, judged righteous, no flesh justified in his sight by the law, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3.20 the law does not give us righteousness. The law reveals our sin. And so Paul's going to go a little bit farther with that concept here in our text this morning. Verse 5, Romans 7, 5. For when we were, what's that phrase? In the flesh. What's that mean? Before we were saved. Okay. The motions of sin or the passions of our sin is the way the, uh, Hol the Holman reads it. The ESV says, uh, our sinful passions aroused by the law. That's an interesting statement. Our sinful passions aroused by the law. The, the uh, King James has the motions of sin. They were aroused. They were intensified by the law. How can our sin be intensified by the command? Nine of the commands were thou shalt not. They were negative. Let me illustrate it this way. If your child is ready for church and there's some time before you're going to leave for church and they might go outside, any parents brave enough to let your child go outside before church, after they're dressed for church, or even if they're just playing in the yard, if you say to that child, don't step in the mud puddle, Something about that phrase instantly creates an irresistible magnetism. And that child is drawn to that mud puddle. Think of it this way. If someone is trying to stop smoking and they're doing okay and they're not thinking about it, and they come into some place and they see a sign that says, no smoking, all of a sudden, what do they start thinking about? Ugh. See, when the law was given, the law arouses within us that sinful nature which is inherent to who we are to rebel against God. You do not have to teach children to lie. I'm reminded of a little boy who was memorizing Bible verses and he got them mixed up. One verse was, the Lord is a very present help in time of need. And the other verse was, a lie is an abomination to the Lord. So when he was called on to recite his memory verse, he says, a lie is an abomination to the Lord and a very present help in time of need. <laughs> Kids will lie about what they wish were true. Kids will lie about what they wish were true. Did you step in that mud puddle? Nope, really I didn't. I don't know how this mud got on me. In the words of Bill Cosby, the man, the man, he threw the mud on me. If you ever listened to Bill Cosby, you missed it, anyway, whatever. Um, it's something that naturally happens because we, at that moment, the child is wishing with all their heart. Did you throw the rock through the window? Nope, I did not. What they mean is, right now, I wish with all my heart I had not thrown that rock through the window. Incidentally, don't put a child or a grandchild in that position. Just assume that they did it. Why did you throw the rock through the window? I mean, don't ask them, did you? I mean, it's natural. They're going to lie. You know, you don't have to teach them to do that. It's nature. It's part of who we are as sinners. And so, as Paul talks about this, he says, the law awakens that. Verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law. We are not bound by the law because we're delivered by death. 
that being dead wherein we were held, we should serve in newness of spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? All right, now, if the law, by virtue of telling us not to do something, awakens within us our sin nature, and we have a stronger tendency to do that, then is the law sin? And the answer is, God forbid, no way. The law is not sin. Here's how the, the Holman reads that. Um, may it never be. I would not have known sin if it were not for the law, verse 7 says. What the law does is it reveals that we are sinners. How many of y'all do any kind of carpentry work at all? Maybe you don't want to admit to that, but okay. A level does not make the wall straight or level. A level simply reveals how far out of plumb it is. That's what the level does. You have to make the The law does not make us righteous. The law reveals how far out of plumb we are with God's righteousness. That's what the law does. It does not level us to God's righteousness. It reveals it. Paul says this, he says, when the law says thou shalt not covet, and here's, here's what he says, verse 7, nay, I had, had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, epithumia, strong desire, uh, covetousness is, is how uh, some other versions read that. Uh, the Holman says this, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. And again, when you say thou shalt not, what does that do? It irritates our sin nature. It, it excites it. It ex exacerbates it. It exaggerates it. And when God says thou shalt not, our initial response is to say, well, why not? Why not? And of course, Satan's right there saying, oh, God God's wants to keep you from having fun. That's why. That's all it is. All the way back in Genesis, his statement to Adam and Eve was, God's holding you back from having your eyes opened. Incidentally, the puppies have their eyes open. All of them now, right? Okay. We're not going to go into whether that makes them Democrat or Republican puppies now. In, in, in any case, in any case, I really could have continued without saying that. All right. But, 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 the, but the reality is, all right, sin opens our eyes and it points out that we are sinners. And it causes us to go more and more in the direction of that. And so Paul says, I would not have known covetousness, but the law says, thou shalt not covet. Then look at verse 8. But sin taking occasion by the commandment. Holman says, sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. When it says, thou shalt not covet, boy, what do we do? We, do, we covet, and we covet more and more. We covet ways we wouldn't have thought about coveting, but we want to covet because the law says, thou shalt not covet. And that's what Paul says. And it's not the law that makes us do that. It's the sin within us that makes us do that. But the law kind of aggravates that sin nature to cause us to become more aware of our sinfulness and how guilty we are. So, Paul develops what's suggested in verse 5. It's not just that the law reveals our sin, but by pro prohibiting our sin, the law actually serves to increase our sin because of our sin nature that rebels against the law. Again, tell a child, don't step in the mud puddle, watch what happens. They cannot keep out of it unless the fear is strong enough. <laughs> so, anyhow, we won't, that's, today's not for child discipline. All right. So, again, seizing an opportunity, it produced in Paul all kinds of covetousness. Wycliffe says this, Wycliffe Bible Commentary, the longing for that which is evil becomes apparent when the commandment declares, this evil thing is forbidden. Then the sinner wants it. That's our nature. That's our sin nature. Paul says, before the law, I didn't have the same level of accountability before God. 
Verse 8, apart from the law, sin is dead. Or without the law, sin was dead. Before the law, Paul didn't have the list of the things that were prohibited. But once the law came, all the list was there. Paul became very aware of his sin because his nature goes toward all those things that God says, thou shalt not. Paul is saying that without the law, sin is not apparent to us. Just like it takes the level to show how far out of plumb we are, the law reveals to us how rebellious we are, how stubborn our hearts in regard to the nature of God. Now, verse 9. I was alive without the law once. When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What Paul, the timing of this is unclear. Uh, some suggest, well, this was while Paul was just a child. When he reached his bar mitzvah, and uh, the bar mitzvah is, hang on a second, I got a, I've got the quote on that here. I think I put it in your notes. Well, I don't... Okay, all right, it's the son of the commandment. That's the idea, all right? And some say, well, it's when Paul reached that point and then he became aware of the law because he, was, he expresses his commitment to keep the law. Another possibility is that Paul, through most of his life, is working to be righteous. I'm not going to turn to him, but you have two references in there. The first is in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. This is the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he says this, he asks... Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. What were the commandments, you know? Keep all the commandments. And the, the young man says, all of these, and this is the second problem the young man has, all of these have I kept from my youth up. That's his second problem. He believes that he has faithfully kept the law and that he is not a sinner. That's the first problem. He doesn't know who he, that's the second problem. He doesn't know who he is. The first problem is, Jesus says, you call me good. What are you saying? Are you acknowledging that I'm God? There's only one good but God. Is that what you're acknowledging? And the rich young ruler totally misses that. And then they go into the second part. The third failure is not the real issue. The third failure only demonstrates the first two issues. Jesus says, okay, if you want to have eternal life, sell everything you have, give it to the poor. If he had realized that Jesus was God... Do you think he would have obeyed the command no matter what it was? Absolutely. So his failure to do that is not what caused him to go away sorrowful. Well, that's what caused him to go away sorrowful. That wasn't the problem. The problem was he didn't know who Jesus was. Second problem, he didn't know who he was. Jesus was God. He was a sinner. And that was demonstrated by his... But he believed that he had kept the whole law. Paul, from his youth up, had strove, had, tr had lived his life to do all that God had required of him. And in Philippians, and you have the reference to that as well, Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 6, Paul says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. That's how on fire I was about my faith. I was persecuting those infidels. That's his mindset. And then he says, Philippians 3, 6, Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You don't have the full reference. That's Philippians 3, 6. You can look it up later. Blameless. Incredible. Paul declares that in his own eyes, as far as keeping the law was concerned, he was without blame. So it's possible that Paul reaches a point where he understands, well, he did reach a point where he understood that the law would never make you righteous. That's what he declares in Romans 3. And so with that understanding comes the guilt that the law brings. Continue on there. The commandment which was ordained to life, um, Deuteronomy 8.1, all the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do that you may live. Luke chapter 10 Another one of the Jewish leaders comes to Jesus and he says, what do I have to do? What good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the law. What do you think? And he quotes the Shema from Deuteronomy. 
And the Shema is from Deuteronomy 6, 3, and that is basically, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, all your body. You compare them all, love God with all that you are. That's the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 3. And the second part of that is love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, well, how you doing? And he says, well, who's my neighbor? But the point is, he believed that he was keeping that sufficiently to impress God enough to where that he would be okay. That was their mindset. The law, if they kept it, would have brought righteousness. But guess what? They can't keep it. So the point of the law is to show us, well, we sin, and so we have sacrifice. And the sacrifice points to Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. Paul says, sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Verse 11, the Holman says this, Sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. Did the law deceive Paul? Look at verse 11. Look at it. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. The law didn't deceive. Sin deceived. Understand this. Sin is deceptive. I've shared before and I'll, I'll repeat this. Sin will take you farther than you wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And it will cost you far more than you ever thought you'd have to pay. Sin is deceitful. It is deceptive. But through the law, Paul became very, very aware of his sin. The law highlights, perhaps we could say it exaggerates our sinful condition, makes us more aware of the death we all deserve. So by making us aware of that judgment and death that we deserve in that sense, we could say that the law kills us. Because the law reveals it. The law shows. So, does that mean the law is bad? Verse 12, wherefore the law is holy, the commandment is holy, just, and good. Paul clarifies the law is not evil. The law is holy, just, and good. It's not evil, it's not unrighteous, it's not bad. Sin is evil, unjust, and bad. So what caused Paul's death? The law? No, sin caused Paul's death. The law simply revealed it. Verse 13, Holman reads this way. Through the commandment, sin has become or becomes sinful beyond measure. The law is not sinful, but the law points out our sin. And I would take you back to a passage where we were a few weeks back, Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Here's how the, here's how, here's how the King James reads, Romans 5, 20. The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Holman reads this way. The law came along to multiply the tras trespass, but where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. Understand this. Every one of us here in this room, you, me, the person to your right, the person to your left, the person behind you, the person in front of you, those on the front row, the person in front of you is me. All right? We are all sinners. And we depend on the grace of God. Romans chapter 3, turn back there with me if you will. Romans chapter 3, and I want you to start at verse 22. And that's in your notes somewhere. Incidentally, the reason I give you notes is because two reasons. One, I know I'm not going to cover it all. But more importantly than that, I give you the notes so you can go back and see what I said and look at the scriptures and see if the scriptures say what I said. Because the only way that you are bound by what I said is if what I said is what the scripture said. If I said something the scripture didn't say, just forget it, ignore it, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what God says. Romans chapter 3, pick up with me in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth to be a propitiation, a satisfaction, a payment, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, 
through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. By the law of faith. Verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Let me summarize that here, okay? Romans 3.23 says, we're all, all sin and come short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid the price for the sins of all who would believe in him. His death is sufficient to cover us all. And so when we come to Christ acknowledging that we are sinners, and when we understand that we can never be righteous in anything that we do by keeping the law and we trust in him and we cast ourselves upon his mercy and his grace, it is totally sufficient to carry and sustain us. Believing in Jesus Christ is, is like this. I think this chair is a pretty good chair. It looks like a good chair, don't you think? I believe this chair will hold me up. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross to save me from my sins. But until I stop resting on my own strength, until I stop standing on my own two feet and cast my eternal salvation totally upon Jesus Christ, not upon what I do, I have not rested in him. I believe this chair will hold me, but I have not put myself into that chair yet. When I take and I rest myself completely in this chair, that's when I'm trusting in this chair. As long as we are trying by our own efforts, by our own righteousness to make it to heaven, we are not resting in the cross. Do we understand that? And so we rest in the Lord Jesus Christ because it can't be by the law. It's not by the law. The law makes us guilty. The law doesn't make us righteous. Only faith in Christ makes us righteous. And however many our sins may be, the grace and mercy and love of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cover them. May we bow our heads. Father, if there's one here this morning who does not know you, I pray, Lord, that the truth of your word might have spoken to their heart and that your Holy Spirit might even now be drawing them to the Savior. It's not in being a member of a church. It's not in our own righteousness. It's not in being baptized. It's only in Jesus Christ that our salvation is found. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here trusting in anything else other than Jesus Christ, that this morning they might cast themselves totally upon the cross. That they might rest completely and fully in the sufficiency of that sacrifice to pay for our sins. Father, in the quietness of this moment, I just feel like I need to give anyone here who might not know the Lord an opportunity to trust Him. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, you're not trusting completely in Him, I want to give you an opportunity to rest in Christ. I want to give you a prayer. If this is the prayer of your heart, pray it. Silently in your heart, you just you and God, pray this prayer. Dear God, in your heart, if you're not sure you're a believer, this is the prayer. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus paid the price. I know I could never pay the price. I know I could never be righteous. But right now I accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as full payment for all of my sin. I trust in Christ. I believe in Christ. I accept Jesus as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I would pray that if there's one here who prayed that prayer, that we might be able to rejoice with them. They might share that. 
I pray, Lord, that for those of us who have walked with you for a long time, that we might understand the freedom that we have in Christ. We are not bound to the law. We are bound to Jesus Christ. We are freed from the law. And we have freedom in Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would walk in that grace and in that freedom that you have freely given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.